Wonderful to have uh, old friends and new friends, strange friends, and absolutely eternal friends. This is no small thing that we can all gather ourselves together like that. And every day, every day that we have is a gift from heaven above. It was created before the foundation of the earth, designed every detail of it, every hour, every minute, every word, every thought has already been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we get to explore and to experience the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you for giving me grace Friday in Israel, especially before the Sabbath and especially before the high holiday Sabbath, which is it kind of happens actually Pentecost, Shavuot, as we call it in Israel, starts tomorrow night, the way the calendar runs. It falls on a Sunday, but that means that Saturday night is the beginning of the festivities. And the way it is here in Israel, the festivities already started yesterday. We were having absolute crazy stuff in the streets, parties and rallies and celebrations. And the little village where we live right outside of Jerusalem here is kind of a hotspot for uh, messianic believers events. And the events already started yesterday, it will continue today and into tomorrow and into Monday. So it is going to be a busy time here. But uh, as much as our meeting is concerned today, again, I wanted to just say thank you. Um, apologies for running a little late. Internet was, uh, the internet must have been in a Shabbat mood here <laughs> because it gotten slow down on me, which doesn't happen too often in Israel, but it did happen, but gave me a few more minutes to uh, clean up and shape up because uh, today was a big cleanup day in the house, in the yard, getting ready for the weekend and for the holiday. And also thank you for uh, being flexible enough to not do things as usual, but uh, allowing me to share a short word with you. And then you can move on into worship and prayer because uh, we have a Shabbat dinner obligation with some dear friends here in the village that um, we don't want to be too late for. So thank you for your grace. And we have been watching the queen and the horses and the chariots and the flags and the outfits. I can tell you, no one does it like you guys. You have, somebody must have captured a glimpse from heaven above uh, regarding the pomp and celebration. Uh, we love the royal celebrations that uh, you get to echo and... Uh, we pray that the people are blessed, that the people are safe, and that the Lord gets some of the glory. I'm sure that even for the sake of the elect, uh, he allows us to keep going. And so never doubt that, you know, we have uh, different initiatives that we all are given to. And as much as the audience on today's call, I'm, I'm, I'm certain uh, the initiatives would be those of prayer and intercession and worship and uh, uniquely positioned by the Lord in certain spheres in life, uh, sometimes for a short season, sometimes for a lifelong calling, the Lord is positioning his people to make a difference. And I want you to be encouraged in this sense. We are literally on the winning side all the time. The world appears to be uh, having the upper hand, but that's just because God is merciful and long suffering. The fact is that it is God's initiative that is always leading the parade and it is God's people who are always setting the tone of what's going on. Yes, the world looks impressive and uh, governments and kingdoms and empires. And here we see again, the platinum celebrations of uh, Her Excellence, Her Royalty, and things look very impressive. But don't you ever forget, God is harvesting every generation. He's adding people to the book of life. The Bible says that he has a book. I believe God has a pen. I don't think he works with computers. I think there's actually a, a, an angel that is uh, transcribing 
and uh, writing things down. And, and he knows our names. He knows the names of the elect from before the foundations of the earth. He knows everyone who must be coming in. And he checks us, everyone that comes in. And when the last one comes in, it's over. It's the end of the game. And so we, the elect, are actually setting the note. Don't forget that. As humble as you may feel, and as little as you may be, and as weak as we are, we are actually in the company of the champion of champions. And it is for the sake of the elect, for our sake and many others like us, that the world keeps running and spinning about. And, you know, we look at the news and we look at the, uh, the pandemic that's been going, ravaging the world and all the scary news and all of the hullabaloo that's been going on. Well, Jesus talked about it long ago. And he told us what to expect when the end is coming in. And by the way, he didn't say that he's doing it. He just says, watch for these signs. I think that these signs are actually uh, devil oriented. They're actually darkness generated because hell senses the end of the game. The Lord is near. His appearance is upon us. And so the earth and all of its inhabitants will continue to rock and roll uh, in hopes of drawing many's attention away from the main thing that is really going on. And that is the great harvest of the nations and the preparation for the greatest revival Israel had ever seen and experienced. Now, if we are so blessed, we may even see it with our own eyes. And if not, then we are part of the preparatory act of God before the final dramatic, epic, awesome events in human history before the Lord returns. Now, uniquely to our time and our season, this is, as Sister Brenda already noted and prayed so well, this is uh, the preparatory day right before the feast of Pentecost. So I wanted to speak to you just for a few minutes about that um, just to rehearse again the truths of God, you know, there's nothing new under the heavens. I know that as God's people, we're always looking for what is the Lord saying now? What is the, the fresh word of the spirit? Sometimes we get obsessive about it. The Lord didn't tell us necessarily to keep looking for something new. He, he actually tells us more so to rehearse what he had already told us. And in a sense, the seven feasts of the Lord, let's rehearse them. Passover was first. Unleavened bread was second. Comes right on top of it. First fruits is third. Pentecost is fourth. And then trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the last, the greatest, the happiest, and the longest feast of all, tabernacles. Seven feasts of the Lord, all of them are called Moadim in the Hebrew language, Moadim, which are appointed times, days that were set up uniquely on God's calendar for God's people to hold special convocations. Some of them had to do with special sacrifices, special protocols, special procedures with the priesthood, with the Levites. Uh, three of them actually were the main three pilgrim feasts. You know that as well. Passover was the first. Pentecost, what we have now, is the second, Shavuot. And Tabernacles is the third, three times a year. Every male, every man in the nation of Israel was commanded by the Lord to come up to Jerusalem to worship God, to see the Lord, to come to present ourselves before him in a special way. And the way Jewish culture goes, men usually do not travel alone. Even the New Testament tells us that most of the apostles traveled with their wives, possibly families. And so the, the unique, the unusual situation was to be an unmarried man. And so most of them carried their wives and children. This was a major pilgrimage. The whole nation of Israel, three times a year, went into a serious pause. They pushed the pause button and everything was put on hold. Schools shut down. Economies shut down. The stores, the shops, the fields, the animals, 
production, productivity, sales, marketing, everything was shut down for an extended season of time. They didn't, they didn't just shut it down for a day or two the way we do now. Consider Jesus's family, for example, an average Israelite family going up to Jerusalem three times a year on the pilgrim feasts to present themselves before the Lord. They come from the Galilee, they come from Nazareth. All right, consider the timetable. Takes you a couple of days just to pack up the bags and pack up the babies, shut the shop, make sure the animals are settled right. Somebody's gonna watch over the donkey and the goats and a couple of cows in the backyard. And then you start moving down from the hilltop of Galilee down to the Jordan Valley. And then you walk down along the Jordan Valley all the way down to Jericho with your wives, with the babies, with the, with the grandparents, with the livestock, carrying your offerings with you. This was a good two, three, four days walk, maybe even a week if they took their time, jumped in the river once in a while, let the kids swim a little bit, enjoy themselves in the cool of the water of the Jordan before the big hike up from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's a big hike. Some of you were in the land of Israel. You remember the place. Do it by foot, carrying your belongings with you. Maybe you had a donkey with a carriage. Maybe you brought a couple of goats or, or lambs for the sacrifice. They took another day or two. In short, it could have taken them easily one week for an average Galilean family to get from Nazareth to Jerusalem, maybe one week. And then the feasts of the Lord are never short. God loves a celebration. We sell ourselves way too short, giving ourselves a couple of hours here and a couple of hours there and a, a glass of wine here and a glass of wine there. God believes in long, extensive celebrations. Most of our celebrations are week long and they would come up to Jerusalem and they would start visiting with the relatives and camping with the cousins and the, the nephews. And I mean, the city was packed full. There was no room for the people inside of the walled city of Jerusalem. The whole Judean landscape was covered up with tent cities and caravans and um, camping grounds. It was a massive rally. Think about what's going on in England right now, celebrating the platinum celebration of the queen and, 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 and copy it into a Middle Eastern version with a uh, biblical motif, probably bigger. And then they would hassle themselves all the way back home to the Galilee, another week or so of heading back down the hilltop, the hillside to the Jordan Valley, up the Jordan Valley to the Sea of Galilee, and then up from the Sea of Galilee to the hillside or the mountaintops where Nazareth was. In short, they could have been gone and on the road two, three, maybe even four weeks if they took their time. Having a good time, family time, bonding time, play time with the cousins and the nephews and the aunts and the uncles visiting the distant relatives that came from other regions. This was a major community event. And I want you to remember that because this is our God. Us sitting alone in our rooms glued to the screen, that's not the best God has for us. Us being part of broken families where we've become so isolated and broken down. I think England was the first nation, to my recollection, in the European Union when you were still part of the Union that actually um, elected a loneliness minister to your government. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I remember reading about it a couple of years, a couple of years ago. Maybe the position by now has been defunct. I'm not sure. You can educate me. But I remember being so impressed that the British government, Her Majesty's government, elected a loneliness minister to care over the plight of people who are way too lonely. Why? Because we have forsaken the ways of God. So many of our troubles and ailings and, and, and psychological and physiological issues are just because we are not part of a healthy community. So much health, so much comfort, so much strength 
is when we are yoked together with people of like spirit, like mind, who are moving together in the same direction, the same destination. And that is why it is super good to be together today. And I pray that as we give attention to the word of God and to the spirit of the Lord, that you, each and every one of you, may become so much more so empowered and filled with liquid love, the grace of our Heavenly Father, the instant and intimate fellowship of His Spirit, because this really is what Pentecost is all about. So let's have a drink of water and read the word. The book of Leviticus is pretty dry, technical accumulation of rules and regulations. Much of it is about the sacrificial system very detailed. You want to put somebody to sleep, start reading from Leviticus 1, unless, unless you read it through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and you see Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, the one that the whole scriptures talk about. But when we come to Leviticus 23, the note changes from rules and regulations, from um, uh, the, the priesthood protocols and uh, the different uh, what to do and what not to do. We come to Leviticus 23 and all of a sudden, thank God, it's time to celebrate. And uh, the word of God begins to give God's people instructions about the seven feasts of the Lord. And I want to read from verse 15 on. Leviticus 23, verse 15. Now, this is all the word of God. He spoke to Moses to speak to Israel. So it comes down from above through the anointed, ordained spokespersons. Sometimes you are going to be the spokesperson for your family. Sometimes you will have the word of life for the situation that you are in, for the people around you. And so the word comes down, verse 15. Leviticus 23, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offerings, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. We don't know what the date was, because he doesn't tell us you got to do this on April uh, 12th or May 15th. They had to count the days. They had to count seven weeks from the feast of first fruits. You see, the only date we had was the date of the first fruit, the, the first feast, which was the feast of Passa, Passover. Remember? Children of Israel had to bring a lamb per household, a lamb per family. This was their exit out of Egypt. This was the price that was paid. This was the first atoning sacrifice. Before there was even one atonement sacrifice mentioned in the scriptures, they already, they already practiced the first and greatest ones of all. It was the Passover lamb. This was the blood that spared them when the judgments of God came upon the firstborn of Egypt. And this was the night after which they left Egypt with the great exodus. The Passover was on the 14th day of the first month of the year. That's the starting point. That was the starting point of the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it was always on the Sunday after the Passover that they celebrated the first fruits. They brought the first fruits from the fields. Usually at that time of year, March, maybe early April, it fluctuates from year to year. Um, the first fruits were usually the barley harvest in the Middle East. And they would bring it before the priests with great pomp and, and, and celebration. They, they would bring the first earliest sheaves and they would wave them. This used to be the, the wave offering. They would wave them before the high priest and before all of Israel and before all of God. It was consecrating the rest of the harvest that was still buried in the ground. It was sanctifying it all before God with thanksgiving. Now you remember, it's all about Jesus. He is the Passover lamb. He is the unleavened bread, the bread that came down from heaven in whom there is no sin, no leaven in him. Perfect men. One of us made it. You always have to remember that. Just like the first Adam failed, the second Adam made it. We have a representative, a man, a holy man, a divine man, an everlasting man, 
sitting on the right hand of God, our Father. Jesus' most popular name for himself, if you read through the Gospels, was Son of Man. That's how he called himself. And we have one who made it, who passed through the heavens, who lived a perfect life, who offered his life a perfect sacrifice, who ascended into the heavens with a perfect blood, and his offering was accepted. The first thing that John, the apostle, saw in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, he's the last apostle alive. Remember John? That's the name we gave our son, Yohanan, in the Hebrew language, John, the beloved. He sees a door opening up in the heavens. He's caught up in a spirit and he's drawn into the headquarters in heaven above. And what's the first thing John saw? When you read in the scriptures, he saw in the midst of heaven, a lamb as if slain. The blood still fresh. There is an altar that was built without hands and upon which there's the blood. And I believe that this blood will never congeal, ever, never, always be there, fresh. Always be there as a reminder. Always be there so that we can have an eternity with our Heavenly Father, brothers and sisters, for the great Son of Man, celebrating, growing, serving, laboring together forever and eternity. Some of you are trying to study Hebrew. Well, that's why you have eternity for. It's going to take you forever to figure it out. And maybe I'll be one of your teachers. But fact is that the word was given us, and it's all about Jesus. He is the Passover lamb. He is the unleavened bread. He was the first fruits. That was the day that he rose from the grave. Right when the Levites and the priests came up into the temple courts from the, from the fields in the Bethlehem area, and they would wave the sheaves, they would wave the wave offering before the Lord, saying, God, thank you for the first fruits of our harvest. And they sanctified by thanksgiving the rest of the harvest that was still in the fields. Jesus rose from the grave, and he's our first fruit. And he's waved before God, our Father. He was raised because the forgiveness of our sins. He was raised perfect and justified. And he was raised and sanctified before our Heavenly Father on behalf of us. The rest of the harvest that was still buried in the sands of time, in the generations to come. And so now they come for the fourth feast count seven weeks. Verse 16, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves, a two-tenths of an ephah, and they shall be of fine flour. Some of you like to bake. Bless your hearts. We've always been baking before the Lord. In fact, the priests were some of the original bakers. And they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord. And you shall offer it with bread, seven lambs uh, of the first year, without blemish, one young bull and two rams. And they shall be as burnt offerings to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. God can smell. God can hear. God can see. God can taste. What do you think he's like? If we were created in his image, in his likeness, he made us male and female, he made us. Then he has all of our senses only multiplied a billion zillion times. And every time the apostle tells us that we are now, we have become the fragrance of Messiah. You and I. You need to internalize this. We, to our Heavenly Father, are a fragrant aroma. Every time that you turn your attention to the Lord, every time that you lift up a prayer, every time that you open the book, our holy book, with real heart 
attention and devotion, when you are willing to shed a tear, when you are willing to be moved with the burdens of heaven, every time that you draw near to God, he smells the aroma of his son. Do you believe it? Because that's what the apostle told us. We are the aroma of the beautiful, perfect, obedient, resurrected son of God. Why? Because he set us with him in the heavenly places. I know you are stuck at home in front of the screen having to watch me talk. I know you have a real life and you have to pay the bills. Uh, I was cleaning. I was doing house cleaning today and then yard cleaning today. And then I took a nap. I know we have a real down to earth life, but you have a greater life. A life that will go on forever. When you shed this body of flesh, one day it will be over. And if, perhaps, if we get to be so blessed and we become uh, and we live so late in the game that, as the apostle said, those who remain, I think there's going to be a special grace. Those who remain, people who will live on and on and on, who will remain until he returns. Some of us will not die. Somebody on this planet, a generation will come who will not die. They will not pass through death in order to come to the resurrection life, but they will change with a twinkling of an eye, with a split atomic second, nanosecond, shed off this body of flesh and put on the glorious body, the redemption of our bodies. It's going to happen one of these days. The apostle Paul, the papa of our New Testament writings, he wrote two-thirds of the book. He thought it will happen in his time. He spoke about it in such immediate terms. Why shouldn't we 2,000 years later? Great celebration. A pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you will sacrifice the kid and the goat of the sin offerings and the lambs and the bulls. And then you shall proclaim, verse 21, on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work. Take a break. Have a Sabbath. Don't work. It shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings throughout all your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, and you shall not wholly reap it, the corners of it, but you will leave it. The fields and you reap, you shall uh, gather, uh, nor gather any of the gleanings from the harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Jehovah, your God. This is the first mention of this feast. It is the feast number four. Now, all three first feasts were fulfilled by the Lord personally in his death, burial, and resurrection on time. Jesus didn't fulfill them approximately. He didn't fulfill them generally. He did not fulfill them mystically, symbolically, roughly, about the right time. He fulfilled every feast of God on time. God is on time. That's why I like to be on time. In my little miserable life, at least I'd like to be on time for the important things. I think I still have some important appointments in my life. I'd like to be on time for them. And this feast was also fulfilled on time. Remember after his resurrection the lord spent 40 days with the disciples coming in going out walking through walls showing up in locked rooms awesome things speaking to them about what what did he do was he showing them his hands and his feet saying ouch that really hurt no he was speaking to them about things pertaining to the kingdom of heaven 40 days with the Son of God, having a Bible study about the only thing that matters, the kingdom of heaven. 
because the kingdom will last forever. That's why it is worthwhile. I know we have to take care of business. I know. We have a life. We have obligations. We have people. We have bills. We have, we have, we have stuff. But the kingdom is the only thing that will last forever. And so for 40 days, he educated the first generation believers so that they can lay the path upon which you and I still walk 2,000 years later. So good. Such a teaching. Such treasure was poured into that first generation. And if you read church history, and if you look into the Hebraic um, sources, that church was awesome. That first generation of believers in Jerusalem, they were unheard of. They had such favor, such power, such grace, such, I mean, they were popular with everyone, loved them. For 31st year of the faith, the Jerusalem church was literally a heaven on earth. Everybody loved them. The Romans loved them. The peasants loved them. Most of the Jewish people loved them. They were the only stabilizing a part of society. And it was not until they massacred Jake, Jacob the Just, Yaakov, the half brother of the Lord. Your King James changed his name to James because he wanted to insert himself into the scriptures. Well, God bless his soul. He's going to have to talk to Papa about it. But it was Jacob the Just. When they threw him off the walls of the city because he would not denounce the Lord, that day, their fate was sealed. The ser most serious Roman persecution started, and within 10 days, the nation was ruined, Jerusalem was demolished, the temple was burnt down, and the people were scattered. But for 30 years, from about 30 to about 60 AD, the church was awesome. Miracles resurrections, sharing all things in common. The apostles were, were, were teaching the doctrines of the kingdom of heaven. The people were absolutely harvesting their neighborhoods, harvesting their towns. There was a reason why the priesthood was so mad at the disciples when they told them, Jerusalem is filled up with that name. Stop it. They could not stop it. We are unstoppable. You are unstoppable. I know you look in the mirror and you're amazed. But look in the mirror of the word of God if you really want to be amazed. You are unstoppable. You belong to a family that will go on forever, that overcomes every kingdom, every empire, every, every ruler, every wannabe who dragged their sorry tale upon this earth Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. He raises kings and he brings them back down again. He tears them apart. But you and I keep going and we will keep going forever because we have a great high priest who is seated on the right hand of the Father who intercedes for us. Did you ever wonder what does Jesus pray for us about? Oh, Lord, please give Reuben a new car. He's driving such an old rickety, rickety car. He needs a, no, he's not praying for my new car that I need. He's not praying that we will make our, the next month's bills. He's not, he's not even praying that we will, you know, gain better. I don't think that he's interceding for the things that you and I are so concerned about. I think that he's praying exactly the way he prayed for Peter when he told him, Peter, I know you're going to deny me and denounce me and betray me three times. I know. I know the devil come to sift you as wheat. I know. But I have already prayed for you. I prayed that your faith will stand. We have a great high priest who is that tight with our heavenly father who is interceding for us all the time that our faith will hold. Because if you have faith, you have everything else. Faith literally is our victory. Faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
And so the fourth feast of God was also fulfilled on time. For 40 days, the Lord taught them concerning the kingdom of heaven, and then he took them to the other side of the mountain of olives. Some of you have been there. There's a great big steeple built on the top of the Mount of Olives. It's called the Ascension Chapel. It's all right. Not exactly the right location because the Gospel of Luke says that they crossed over the summit and went down the other side all the way to Bethany which was on the other side, on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives. And there he lifted up his hands. There he blessed the disciples. And there he took off and was carried up in the clouds and vanished. And he told them, go back and wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. He didn't tell them how long. He didn't tell them that it's going to be only 10 days. As much as the disciples knew, they maybe should have been there for 10 years. Who knows? But the fact remains that it was exactly 10 days from the ascension that they hit the feast of Pentecost. And that's what we hear in Acts in chapter 2. And allow me to read this for you. Acts 2 and verse 1. They just came back from the Mount of Olives a band of small disciples. The scripture says that they were actually in the upper room and that they were afraid. Now, afraid of what? They were, they were afraid in the beginning. They were afraid of the Romans. They were afraid of the temple guard. They were afraid of themselves. Who else is going to betray us? Who else is going gonna, is gonna to turn his back on the, the band of believers? Maybe you have to consider that. Maybe they were afraid of what will Jesus do to them? Will he show up and say, why did you not believe? Will he show up and rebuke them and punish them? Because none of them believed. They could hardly even believe the testimony of the women when they came back from the grave and found it empty. They had good reasons to be afraid, humanly speaking. But they waited for 10 days. And when the day of Shavuot came, had fully come, I like the biblical language, special grace. It didn't come roughly. It wasn't about Pentecost time. The gospel writers didn't, didn't, didn't just write because they thought, they kind of remembered it was about, about Pentecost. I remember because I got a couple of greeting cards from, from Aunt, Aunt Mary from Judea. No, this was fully upon them. They were all with one accord in one place, probably the very same upper room most of our scholars believe, where they were for the Passover meal. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house, and they were sitting, and there appeared to them, upon them, divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance, and the next of the story, the rest of the chapter, is the, the beginning of the revival. Heaven breaking on earth in Jerusalem. Now let me tell you what happened. According to our understanding of the chronology of the scriptures, we received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai on Pentecost, the same feast. 1,500 years earlier. According to the best of our understanding from the Exodus account, Israel came out of Egypt the day after the Passover, and it took them a couple of months. There's actually pretty clear indications in the scriptures when they arrived to the vicinity of Mount Sinai and how long it took for Moses to go up, have the first encounter with the Lord, because he went up a few times, you remember, much because of our own, the, the our own foolishness and the disobedience of God's people. But the story remains that it was 
according to Jewish tradition that is backed by pretty good biblical facts, it was on Pentecost, Shavuot, that we received the law. 1500 years forward, because we've been in the wilderness for 40 years, and then the judges for about 400 years, and then uh, the kings of Israel for about 1000 years until Jesus. And now he lives by about the age of 30, he launches into a public ministry that most of us believe was about three and a half years, even though you might find it interesting to know, there's no one indication in the scriptures that the ministry of the Lord Jesus lasted three and a half years, not one hint. The only reason we believe it was three and a half years is because the gospels describe three cycles of Passovers where the Lord kept coming up to Jerusalem for the pilgrim feasts. On the third one, he offered himself. And so common sense tells us, well, it was at least three, three and a half years. Could have been six or seven years. Think about that. How would you like having Jesus around for twice as many years as what we think he was? doing a deeper work, spending more time, cultivating more hearts, raising more dead and healing more people and teaching more parables than what we thought. Because wasn't it John who told us the great big disclaimer at the end of the Gospel of John when he said, hey, I'm doing my best here. But if we were to write everything the Lord said and describe everything the Lord had done, the whole world will not be enough to contain the volumes of the books that would have to be written. That's the Jesus we worship. You see, we believe in the Bible and a whole lot more as the Lord reveals to us by the Spirit. And that's the wonder of Pentecost. And that's what I wanted to, to live with you today as a, perhaps as an abiding thought that you can take with you into the worship time. Because I have to move on and eat. We have a Shabbat dinner cooking uh, a block down the street from us. And I'm the guest of honor. And I know that you don't want them to eat cold food because of me. And so by God's grace, you will release me soon. But that's the thought I wanted to leave with you as I ramble on here. This is our Pentecost. On the first Pentecost, he gave us the word, the law, the Ten Commandments, and the attending 613 other commandments that became that incredibly complicated Jewish law as we know it to be probably made 10 times, 100 times more complicated because of the rabbinical traditions that were added over the years to, to, to try to make sure that we fulfill God's law perfectly, as if our perfection was ever the issue. It was never our perfection. It was always our love and devotion to him. God's greatest promises and covenants were made with nothing in return. All he wanted is obedience, faith, devotion. Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And the Lord himself told us on these, on these two short commandments, one sentence, stand the entire law and the prophets. If we can do this right, friends, we are fragrant aroma to our Heavenly Father. Love the Lord thy God. Oh, Father, that we may love you like that all the time. Never depart. Never stray too far. And when we stray, may we quickly, quickly be brought back in with a, with, a, with, a, with a pull of the leash, with a nudge of your finger, with a, with a kick of your boot, whatever it takes, get us back online and back in our place in the Father's embrace. Because there's no life out there. It's a barren land away from his love. 
And he's offered it to us so graciously, so generously. In 1,500 difficult years after we received the law, he gave us the spirit. And I'll just say this. Remember the Lord had a conversation, one of his many visits to the temple courts, and he cried out. It was in the greatest and the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the great day of the feast when they would celebrate the water offerings. They would pour water from the pool of Shiloh and pour it upon the altar and give praise to God as thanksgiving for the rainy season is upon us and the great harvest of the next year are going to be secured. What a great celebration. And, and Jesus has such a talent for just stepping on everybody's toe and he lifts up his voice john writes to us and he shouts in the temple courts and he says this is all about me he says you come and draw living waters from me he says he says for this he spoke of the spirit and john interprets the saying of the Lord, he says, this he spoke concerning the spirit because the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The gospel of John, chapter 7. Well, now Jesus was glorified. Now he was crucified and buried and laid in the grave. Now, he already went through the power, the most powerful act ever probably experienced in God's universe. We have in the resurrection of Jesus, we have different descriptions of it. And we are, we, we are given the assurance in the scriptures that the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Lord himself were involved in his resurrection moment. The moment that that power hit the dead body in the grave, that moment that every molecule, every bit of DNA came back to life, that moment that left its mark upon the Shroud of Turin. And if you never heard of it, check it out, because I believe it is of God. The Shroud of Turin brings great testimony to our generation, because by now we can analyze what's been happening and what, what this shroud tells us from 2,000 years ago, darkened cave, burial cave that went into incredible, blinding light. Now, Jesus ascended into the heavens, bringing an offering, his own blood. Now the price has been paid. Now God's justice and righteousness are satisfied. The holiness of God and the righteousness of God have met and kissed each other for the first time because the prize was paid. Now that Jesus was glorified, he could pour out his spirit. And that's what happened at Pentecost. This was not just another great rally. Let's have revival downtown in Windsor tomorrow night for three days. We're going to preach the gospel and bring a few folks to God. No, no. This was heaven pouring down lavish upon earth. The stops are open wide. The floodgates are opened. God has no need to keep himself away from us any longer because the price has been paid. Sin has been settled. It is over if we only believe, if we only believe such a message, such a gospel, the good news travels from generation to generation, from hamlet to city, from city to kingdoms, from kingdoms to empires. It's spreading throughout the whole earth and it is unstoppable. Kingdoms will rise and kingdoms will fall. Jesus predicted it. And he said the only thing he actually told us to do in Matthew 24, when he described to the disciples and to us the, the dynamics of planet Earth before the end, because they asked him. They sat on the Mount of Olives. They looked upon the beautiful, glorious temple complex on the Mount of Moriah. And they asked him, oh, they were so proud. They were so happy with their religion. We all are. What a great meeting we had last night. What a beautiful revival we had last month. What a great prayer time I had this morning. We love our religions. And they asked the Lord, look at the temple. 
Look at the priesthood blowing the trumpets, the Levites singing the songs of ascents at the temple courts, the smoke of the sacrifices blowing across the Judean hillside, the fragrance of the scorched meat is all over the city. What a glorious religion we have. Don't you think so, Jesus? And he looked at them at the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, and he said, hmm, hate to break this upon you, boys, but the whole thing's coming down. Not one stone shall remain upon another. And we can speak about this another day. But when he described to them, because they asked him, what will be? the end and the sign of your coming. And he answered their question in the rest of the chapter is the Lord Jesus's own words describing the dynamics of planet earth before his return. But the only thing that he told us to do about it was do not be troubled. Please do yourself a favor. Quit watching the news. Well, watch a little bit. And then move on to something a little more productive. Do not be troubled and do not be deceived, he said. Keep our eyes focused on him. He told Martha, oh, Martha, Martha, you are troubled about so many things, but only one thing matters. And Mary has chosen the right thing. What was Mary doing? sitting at his feet, drinking up his words. You know that. You already do that. Well, do it more. Be a little more intentional about it because the days are evil. And we will be keep drawing into this and into that, the wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and kingdoms will rise against kingdoms and people against people. It is, it will continue to be a mess. I hate to tell you that, but the Lord already told us that so long ago. But for you and for me, only one thing matters. And on this Pentecostal meeting today, Coming into the great Shavuot, Pentecost, 70 in the Latin language, 50. We counted Pente. It is the feast of the 50 days, seven weeks. Let's remember that our father's heart was satisfied on that day in a marvelous and a beautiful way because he could pour himself again into human vessels. You need to understand, friends. You want the big picture? Do you want to know what's going on? This is what's going on. God is intent about restoring what he started in the Garden of Eden. And even better, he always wanted to dwell in us. How did it all begin? Well, on the sixth day of creation, God fashioned a little clay statue. Remember our beginnings? You need to remember that so we don't get lost on the way. He fashioned a little clay statue made from earth, made from the ground. That's why we are called Adam in the Hebrew language. It's taken from the same root word, Adama, dirt, earth dust and God fashioned a beautiful little statue and, and there we laid there in the midst of the beautiful little garden and God made a beautiful little person made of clay laid there perfect all the animals were coming by sniffing licking wondering wow what is this it's in the image of the creator. What's going to happen with him? And then the Lord leaned down at us and gave us a mouth to mouth resuscitation. And he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. This was always the plan, my friends. 
this was always the plan and he does not have another. God is not a man that he changes his mind or the son of man that he should lie. He always wanted to dwell inside of us. You and I are literally the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is not apostolic poetry. This is not some ancient primitive way to convey some religious ideas, concepts. No. This is the plan. This was always the will of our Father to breathe Himself into us. And so man became a living soul. Well, he fixed it at Pentecost. He fixed it upon Mount Zion, right here, a couple of miles from where I'm sitting today, in the upper room. The band of disciples, all so troubled, so unsure of themselves. Is he mad at me? Is he going to be angry because... I wasn't quite perfectly there because I doubted. And the Lord is saying, I'm not mad. I'm not punishing. It is finished. Price has been paid. The fix is in. Well, what did the Lord tell Nicodemus? Nicodemus, he says, whose name in the Hebrew was Nicodemon. You are, he said, a teacher in Israel. You should know better. You don't know where the wind blows, where it comes from, where it is going. A man must be born again. You won't even see the kingdom of heaven, never mind entering into it, unless you can be born again. We don't have another message. We don't need another message. We live in God's perpetual Pentecost ever since. I know sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we blow it. Sometimes we skip a step. Well, God's got his hounds of heaven to bring us back home. He knows our number. He's got a GPS tracking on us all the time. Did not the Lord himself promise us, no one can take you out of my father's hand? So fear not, little flock. It is the father's good pleasure to give you and you and you and you the kingdom. God bless you all today on this Shavuot celebration. And let's worship God together because he has done what only he could have done. He had accomplished what he always set to accomplish, to dwell inside of us, to breathe his spirit again into our spirit where he dwells in the living, walking, talking temple. And the temple is you. And so, Father, I ask you to seal and bind the words of life into our hearts and minds. Father, I thank you for all those who are under my voice today. And I pray for the angel of the Lord to now come with holy fire from the altar yes. of God and light us up yes. again Lord. in a greater sense, in a greater way, and pour out the oil and pour out the wine and grant us words of life for ourselves and for those we carry in our hearts and for those you planted us amongst them, our families, Lord, our relatives, our neighbors, the work, the colleagues, everyone who runs into our vicinity, we pray, Father God, for their lives, that they may be touched, that they may be transformed, that heaven may claim more and more and more of the children of our earth. For your name's sake, Father, we thank you we bless you. Thank you for coming for us. 
Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for paying the price that we could never pay so that you could pour out your spirit again into men and women of earth. For we are truly the temple of the Lord. In Yeshua's name, be blessed, be strengthened, do good, be good, and I'll see you next time. Shabbat Shalom from Jerusalem. I have a Shabbat meal waiting for me, so I'm going to bid you goodbye. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. I'll be Shabbat in Shalom. Yeah. Shalom. Thank you so much. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Ruben. Yes.